God bless the victims, their families, and America. Thank you very much. It's been said that all truth passes through three stages. The first stage being denial. The second stage being violent opposition. And the third stage being widespread acceptance as common knowledge. Well, as you view this documentary, keep in mind that people watching will probably fall into one of those three categories. One group of people will absolutely deny that what they're seeing could possibly be true. The second group of people will be violently opposed to this kind of information being released, and they'll do everything that they can to discredit the messenger rather than pay attention to the message. And yet there will probably be a third group of people that will sit back in their easy chair and say, I'm not surprised, I knew it all along. With this in mind, let's begin by playing a little word association. I'll say a word, and you think of the first word that comes to mind. Conspiracy theory is what most people think of. We've all been conditioned to associate the word theory with the word conspiracy, because after all, no conspiracies could possibly be true. They're all just theories, aren't they? Well, in the phrase conspiracy theory, there are two words. The first word, conspiracy. The second word is the active word, theory. By definition, a theory is a supposition, an idea, a concept, a hypothesis. Let me give you an example. In theory, if I purchase a raffle ticket, I could win a prize. Now, as long as I don't purchase a raffle ticket, my win is theoretical. But once you purchase a raffle ticket, the win is no longer a theory. It becomes a possibility. And the more raffle tickets you purchase, the more possible and eventually probable the win becomes. Such is the case with a conspiracy theory. As long as there is no evidence, it is a conspiracy theory. But once you have a piece of evidence, no matter how flimsy or circumstantial it may be, it becomes a possibility. And the more evidence that is gathered, the more possible and eventually probable the conspiracy is. You'll be looking at evidence in this documentary, and it will be up to you to decide if this is a conspiracy theory or indeed a conspiracy. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th, malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves, away from the guilty. On September 11, 2001, four events occurred within an hour and 15 minutes of one another. The first event occurred at 8.45 Eastern Standard Time when American Airlines Flight 11 hit the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And then 18 minutes later, at 9.03 Eastern Time, United Airlines Flight 175 slammed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. And then at 9.43, it was reported that American Airlines Flight 77 had hit the Pentagon. And then finally, at 10 o'clock Eastern Time, United Airlines Flight 93 crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Now, unless this is one incredible coincidence, is it not safe to assume that all four of these events are inescapably married to one another? And is it not also safe to assume that if you find one person involved or a party involved with one of these events, they're probably involved in all of them? Well, following this train of thought, since there was no credible claim of responsibility, is it not safe to assume that those involved or those parties involved or agencies or groups that were involved in the events of 9-11 would do anything that they can to obfuscate, distract, or distort or cover up any information that might lead to their discovery? And if that's true, is it not also safe to assume that if you find somebody, a group, an agency, a party that is involved in the obfuscation, distraction, distortion, or cover-up of any information involved in any of the events of 9-11, does it not indicate possible involvement and even guilt in the events of 9-11? Keep this in mind as we look at the video evidence of September 11th.
I mean, it was like a, a cruise missile with wings. Went right there and slammed right into the Pentagon. Huge explosion, a uh, great ball of fire, and smoke started billowing out. Shortly after September 11th, as what usually happens, many conspiracy theories began to emerge as to what really happened on September 11th of 2001. And because many of these theories were not grounded with any evidence, we didn't really pay too much attention to them. However, in February of 2002, my attention was drawn to the following website, entitled Hunt the Boeing, Test Your Perceptions. Now, the original website was completely in French and was released by the French and drew some very serious questions as to what had really happened at the Pentagon. I mean, after all, we had all seen the big hole that was created by the 757 that had slammed into the Pentagon at 9.43 on September 11th. But some of the photographs that were shown on this website raised very serious questions as to whether or not that's exactly what had happened. Some of these photographs showed a smaller hole and in some cases showed that there was no way that a 757 could have created this damage. So we began our own investigation and that started by taking a look at some of the magazines that we all saw at the supermarket checkout stands shortly after the events of September 11th. As I began pouring through the photographs, I had one goal in mind, and that was to prove the French wrong with their website, Hunt the Boeing. After all, there must have been some photographic evidence that showed that a 757 had hit the Pentagon. But as we went through all these photographs, we could find no pictures whatsoever showing a tail, a nose, a fuselage, wings, engine, wheels, luggage, seats, nothing. There were no photographs showing any recognizable wreckage from a 757. Furthermore, when you look at the size of the hole at the Pentagon, it was approximately 65 feet across, and the height of the Pentagon is approximately 73 feet. From wingtip to wingtip, a 757 is 124 feet 10 inches. From nose to tail, a 757 is 155 feet and 3 inches in length. And the height is 44 feet and 6 inches. However, when you look at the hole at the Pentagon, you'll find that it's only approximately 65 feet across. How does a plane of those dimensions fit into a hole only 65 feet across? Upon further inspection, we found that the damage at the Pentagon was completely and totally inconsistent with the damage of the planes that had hit the World Trade Center. I mean, after all, the planes that hit the Trade Center created a fire so intense that it fatigued the steel and collapsed the buildings, or so that's what we were told. And yet, when you look at the left side of the Pentagon, you'll note that there is very little, if any, smoke damage or heat damage at all. On the third floor, it's very plain to see a file cabinet with a computer monitor. Neither of them are damaged. On the second floor, you can see a wooden desk. It hasn't burned. And on the first floor, a very curious sight indeed, a wooden stool with a book that is laying and open. The pages aren't even singed. Now, each of the planes involved in the September 11th attacks had embarked upon transcontinental flights, which means that they had a majority of their fuel left over when they hit their respective targets. That means that approximately 8,600 remaining gallons of fuel would have been ignited on the 757 that had hit the Pentagon. Again, we look at the photograph and ask ourselves, is the smoke and heat damage consistent with that amount of fuel being ignited? Ms. Therese Sagné, a certified environmental specialist and a member of the Environmental Assessors Association, sent us the following letter after a brief conversation we had on the telephone. She had said to us that the amount of fuel that would have been left in the aircraft that had hit the Pentagon would basically have reduced that section of the Pentagon to rubble and would have burned for days. And that 8,600 gallons of fuel had a BTU rate of 86 million. She also stated that looking at the total weight of this aircraft in conjunction with its velocity, the Pentagon should have been reduced to the thickness of a pancake. Also, the fuel spill of 8,600 gallons would have posed a very large soil removal and disposal project, 
since the contaminated soil will be considered hazardous waste under Title 40 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Another interesting question that is raised is in the photographs of the collapsed area of the Pentagon, if you'll note the upper floor and roof area, it appears that that area simply collapsed and does not show any impact damage from a tail section that was over 43 feet in height. How could a 757 slam into the Pentagon and not have an impact area where the tail section would have hit the upper floors? Shortly after these questions were raised and the topic was open for discussion on our radio show, The Power Hour, these five frames were released from a security camera at the Pentagon. The only problem is that the release of these five photographs seemed to raise more questions than they answered. First of all, why was the date incorrect in the lower left corner of the screen? Second of all, they really didn't show that there was a 757 that had hit the Pentagon. And thirdly, many people asked, is this the only security camera that was on at the Pentagon? The Pentagon, this is the nerve center for the United States military, supposedly the most secure building in the country. And this is the only video footage that was available of the most heinous attack ever recorded at the Pentagon? Where were all the other security cameras aimed? What about the security cameras that were on in the hallways of the Pentagon? Every inch of the Pentagon is under video surveillance. Where are those video cameras? We also had a report about a gas station whose video camera was pointed in the exact direction where the 757 would have hit the Pentagon. Shortly after the event, it was reported that federal officials showed up at that gas station and confiscated that footage. In addition to all the magazines that hit the newsstands and the supermarket checkouts, there was a flurry of book releases that hit the local bookstores and in some cases the book section of your local grocery store. One book is America Attacked, which was released by University Press of California and it was edited by Sarah Jess, Gabriel Beck and R. Joseph. In reference to the attack on the Pentagon, on page 194 it states, the jet had plowed a crater 100 feet wide that ripped away the walls of all five stories of the building, collapsing the outermost rings which encircle the Pentagon. In this picture, we ask, do you see a crater 100 feet wide or 50 feet wide? How about in this picture or this picture? It doesn't appear that there was any crater at all. They went on to say that it had ripped away the walls of the five stories of the building, collapsing the outermost rings, which encircle the Pentagon. Now, there should be no question that the outer rings of the Pentagon have indeed collapsed. We've seen pictures from one angle, from another angle, and America has seen these pictures. We all assume that that was the damage that was caused by the 757 hitting the Pentagon. But shortly after the release of the article from Deception to Revelation, we were sent some photographs that were taken apparently right after the event and before the outer walls had collapsed. When examining these photographs, we can clearly see that the area in question had not yet collapsed. In fact, there is very little evidence of a hole big enough to accommodate a 757. The hole that we do see is approximately 14 to 16 feet across. Question, how does a 757 fit into a 16-foot hole and leave no damage or wreckage on the outside of the Pentagon? These are questions that deserve serious scrutiny. Let's take a look at some of the photographs that were taken before the outer wall of the Pentagon collapsed. In this first photograph, we can see the firefighters pulling the hoses away from the fire truck. In the foreground, we can see wire spools that were left on the front lawn of the Pentagon. After all, this section of the Pentagon was under renovation. We'll use these wire spools as reference points. 
Also, to the right of those wire spools and on the face of the Pentagon, we can see that some concrete facing has broken away. We'll also use this as a reference point as we examine these photographs. Now, to the left of that area where the facing has broken off, we can clearly see that the Pentagon has not yet collapsed. There are some flaming areas, and that area appears to be the only section where there is a hole approximately 14 to 16 feet. Question, how does a 757 fit into a 16-foot hole and leave no wreckage on the front of the building? We can also see that the roof of the building does show fatigue, but has not yet collapsed. In this photograph, an astonished onlooker sees exactly what we're seeing. The Pentagon had not yet collapsed. And again, there is no sign of any wreckage whatsoever. No tail, no fuselage, no wings, no wheels, no engines, no seats, no luggage, nothing on the outside of the Pentagon. The Pentagon roof line is clearly visible, and again, it is under fatigue, but it had not yet collapsed. As we examine this next photograph, let's take a good close look at the lower left corner. You'll see engine 331 from the Metropolitan Washington Airport Authority. And we contacted the fire chief from this engine company. Chief Plower agreed to come on our radio show along with two of his firefighters. But one hour before airtime, they canceled. We were told that the two firefighters had been placed on indefinite leave. When we look at this photograph, we can see that the fire retardant foam is being sprayed on the front of the Pentagon. And again, the area in question had not yet collapsed. And you can see right in the center of the photograph, a big area where some of the concrete facing has broken away. And it appears that this is the only major hole in the front of the Pentagon. Again, is this hole big enough to accommodate a 757? And where is the wreckage? In this photograph, we again see engine 331 and fire retardant foam being sprayed on the front of the Pentagon. Note clearly, in the center of the photograph, we see the upper floors of the Pentagon, again, yet to collapse. But, also notice that there does not appear to be any damage to these upper floors. Question, if the height of the Boeing 757 was 44 feet 6 inches, there should have been some point of impact in these upper floors, and yet when we look at these pictures, there doesn't appear to be any impact whatsoever in the area where the tail should have hit. And again, there is no wreckage visible on the front of the lawn. Now while these photographs were being taken, videographers from several different networks were on the scene to capture the firefighters in action as they battled the blazes at the front of the Pentagon. Jim Angle is joining us now from Washington. Uh, Jim, what can you tell us about that fire outside the Pentagon? Jim Engel, are you with us? Uh, I can tell you first that the roads around the White House, the streets around the White House, were blocked seconds ago. Uh, members of the Uniform Division of the Secret Service ran out to intersections and started diverting traffic. There are emergency vehicles on almost every block around the White House. The road south of the White House has also been blocked. And as you know, the White House is being evacuated. Federal employees are standing on the street corners in and around the White House, uh, having left the building for fear of another attack. As you come into Washington from Virginia, about two miles from the Pentagon, you can see the smoke billowing up from the building, huge clouds of smoke, so much so that uh, commuters coming into town have pulled over to the side of a busy freeway, what is ordinarily a busy freeway, and are sitting watching in amazement as the symbol of the United States Defense Establishment uh, goes up in smoke. So there is an amazement all over Washington. Uh, people are not sure what to think. Uh, you've got a lot of federal employees standing around in this area watching as the streets are blocked off and emergency vehicles rush to and fro. We're not sure uh, what they are up to, uh, but clearly there is concern about the safety of the White House and the surrounding buildings. John. Uh, Jim, do you know anything about uh, what kind of uh, plane? Be advised, there's floor collapse, structural integrity is compromised. I'll give you a report on the interior. Okay. 
question. What could have caused this type of damage? What could have caused a 14 to 16 foot hole and pierced three of the rings of the Pentagon? Keep in mind that each ring of the Pentagon has an outer and inner wall. Each wall, approximately 18 inches thick of steel reinforced concrete. That means that each ring consisted of 36 inches or three feet of steel reinforced concrete for a total of approximately nine feet of steel reinforced concrete. Question, could a 757 have pierced nine feet of steel reinforced concrete and left a 14 to 16 foot hole and no wreckage? If not, what could have created that type of damage? On our radio program, The Power Hour, we have a lot of veterans and military experts that listen in, and many have called up and agreed that it could not have been a 757 that created that damage, but in fact had to be something else altogether. What could have caused that damage? Some call it a bunker buster or a missile. Now as this controversy percolated through the year 2002, in January of 2003, the entire issue was resurrected when the American Society of Civil Engineers released a report entitled, The Pentagon Building Performance Report. The announcement was made on CNN and they showed an animated video that illustrated how the 757 slammed into the Pentagon and took out 50 support columns. Let's take another look at this computer-generated animation from the American Society of Civil Engineers at Purdue. And as we look at this plane, ask yourself this question. What significant information was overlooked in this computer graphic model from the American Society of Civil Engineers? Well, first of all, the 18 and a half inch steel reinforced concrete exterior wall of the Pentagon was omitted. Second of all, you'll note that when the tail section enters the Pentagon, it remains intact. How is it possible that the tail section, over 40 feet in height, would have remained intact as it entered the Pentagon and left no entry point, as is seen in this photograph? Thirdly, and probably the most significant omission of all, is that the engines are missing in this computer graphic model. Despite these omissions, the American Society of Civil Engineers claimed that the plane took out 50 support columns as it entered the Pentagon. When we again look at these photographs, I ask, do you see support columns that have been destroyed? Which support columns were destroyed? How could it possibly be that the American Society of Civil Engineers could release such a report when the photographs clearly show that the entire report is in question. Now let's look at a computer generated animation that was broadcast on the National Geographic television program Seconds from Disaster in which they dealt with the attack on the Pentagon on September 11th. In this computer generated animation they show that the wings broke off before the plane entered the first ring. Question, if the plane's wings broke off then why didn't we see any wing parts in the photographs that we examined earlier? Furthermore, in this computer-generated animation, it clearly shows the plane almost completely disintegrating as it passes through the first ring. Question, how could it have continued along its path and pierced another seven and a half feet of steel reinforced concrete, piercing the second and third rings of the Pentagon and leave this hole? You can't have it both ways.
There's an old saying in Tennessee, I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee, that says, fool me once, shame on, shame on you. It fooled me, we can't get fooled again. You know, there are those that see these pictures and hear this information for the first time, and they inevitably ask the question, well, if the plane didn't hit the Pentagon, where did it go? The answer is, I don't know where it went. For all I know, it could be sitting in 200 feet of water in the Atlantic Ocean. But then again, I didn't say that Flight 77 hit the Pentagon. That was NBC and CBS and ABC and CNN and Fox and all the other news agencies. The question should be, if Flight 77 hit the Pentagon, then where is it? And let's keep in mind that if we do find someone, a group or an agency, that is involved when the obfuscation, distraction, distortion, or cover-up of any information about any of the events of September 11th, does that not indicate possible involvement and even guilt in the events of September 11th? Now let's move on to what happened in New York City on the morning of September 11th. These are just a few of the images that are indelibly etched in the minds of every man and woman on the face of this planet that happened to be near a television set on the morning of September 11th of 2001. Most of us will never forget where we were and what we were doing on that day. Now right after September 11th, many conspiracy theories began to arise to try to explain how and why the towers came down. Well, this is no different than any other major event in history, from the assassination of John F. Kennedy to his brother Robert Kennedy, and from the assassinations of Martin Luther King and John Lennon to the explosion in Oklahoma City that destroyed the Murrah Building in 1995 and the downing of TWA Flight 800. All of these were followed by conspiracy theories to try to explain these events. Well, on September 11th, there was a lot of discussion about explosions that went on around the building and in the building. Some of these reports were televised, but only once. Let's take a look at some of these reports and review what had happened on September 11th. We're being pushed out as well because there was some concern that there might be additional explosions, possibly other bombs. The entire top of the building just blew up. The second explosion and another explosion. Uh, we have a report now of a fourth explosion at the Trade Center. There has just been a huge explosion. It almost looks like one of those implosions of buildings that you see. We heard a very loud blast of explosion. Not clear now is why this... Uh, explosion took place. Do you, do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me it sounded like it, it, to me it sounded like an explosion. But it was a huge explosion. A huge... I saw the two buildings. I'm thinking it was, a, it was a bomb because two of them. This is actually, a, we believe, debris from one of the planes that hit one of the towers on the World Trade Center. The FBI is here as you can see. They had roped this area off. They were taking photographs and securing this area just prior to that huge explosion that we all heard and felt. We've just heard a virtual barrage of reports of bombs and explosions going off in and around the World Trade Center. But is there any reason to believe that some of these explosions might have been caused by something other than the planes hitting the towers? Rick Sanchez from MSNBC had this to report. Uh, Rick Sanchez has been there throughout this morning for us. Rick, tell us where you are and what the latest is. Well, I'm in that area, if you're familiar with uh, this area, of uh, where West Broadway and Hudson come together 
uh, right at Chambers. That would put us about a block and a half away from uh, the site of where the explosion was. That area has just been uh, evacuated because uh, police have found what they describe it as a suspicious device and they fear that it might be something that could lead to uh, another explosion. Obviously, there, there, there's a real sense of caution here on the part of police. I spoke with some police officials moments ago, Chris, and they told me that they have reason to believe that one of the explosions at the World Trade Center, aside from the ones that may have been caused by the impact of the plane with the building, may have been caused by a van that was parked in the building that may have had some type of explosive device in it. So their fear is that there may have been explosive device planted either in the building or in the adjacent area, and that's why they're being so cautious. In the September 24th, 2001 edition of People magazine, on page 34, there was an interview with Louis Caccioli, a 51-year-old firefighter assigned with Engine 47 of Harlem, New York and he had this to say. We were the first ones in the second tower after the plane struck. I was taking firefighters up in the elevator to the 24th floor to get in position to evacuate workers. On the last trip up, a bomb went off. We think there was bomb set in the building. Well, Louis Caccioli isn't the only firefighter that claims that there were bombs or explosives going off in and around the World Trade Center. At least two blocks, and we started running. Four by four, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if it had detonated. Yeah, yeah, detonated. They were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. I was watching. We've heard eyewitness accounts and testimony from fire officials that indicate that there were bombs, explosives, possibly detonating charges that were utilized in the collapse of the World Trade Center buildings. Is there any reason to believe that detonating charges were utilized? in the collapse of the North Tower, the South Tower, or Building 7? One firefighter did say, boom, 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 that's how it went down. And many of the television reporters reported that as the buildings collapsed, both the North Tower and the South Tower and Building 7, they all appeared to come down just like a controlled demolition. Let's listen to a clip from Larry Silverstein. He was the lease owner of the World Trade Center as he gave an interview on PBS. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. And then we watched the building collapse. Now, we've just heard Larry Silverstein making the admission that when it came to Building 7, the decision was made to pull it, a term that is used by demolition experts in bringing a building down. But what was America and the rest of the world told as to why Building 7 came down? About an hour ago, World Trade Center Building Number 7 collapsed, a 42-story building weakened by the devastation that had occurred earlier today. We've all seen controlled demolitions on television, office buildings, sports stadiums, all brought down by controlled charges. And these charges and controlled demolitions take weeks of planning. They have to bring in experts and do a structural analysis of the buildings, study which beams, which girders have to have charges placed on them, and then a team of explosive experts has to come and set the charges, wire them all together in sequence. And then, finally, after everything is clear, they let the building go, or pull it. Are we to believe that eight hours after a surprise attack in New York City, they were able to pull Building 7? How is this possible? had it not been planned in advance. And if they did have planned detonation charges in place in building number seven, is it possible that there were charges in building six, or five, or four, or the North Tower, or the South Tower? We made it at least two blocks, and we started running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if it had detonated. Yeah, yeah detonated. They were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. I was watching it and running. It just ran. Ladies and gentlemen, so far we've seen that we were deceived, if not flat out lied to, about many of the events of September 11th. 
from the controversy about whether or not Flight 77 actually hit the Pentagon to whether or not there were bombs or explosives or detonating charges utilized in any of the buildings that collapsed in the World Trade Center. And also Larry Silverstein making the admission that when it came to Building 7, they made the decision to pull it. And now we come to the main events of September 11th, North and South Towers being hit by airliners that were supposedly hijacked by terrorists. Let's take a look at some of the clips that we've all seen over and over again. On April 15th of 2004, we received a news release that alerted us to a website that was entitled www.letsroll911.org. Phil Jahan, the webmaster for this website, had taken the video clips that you've just seen and slowed them down and examined them frame by frame, and what he found was astounding. There are several different anomalies that need to be examined and questioned. First of all, what is attached to the bottom of the plane that hit the South Tower? And second of all, what is that brief flash that occurs just as the plane makes impact? Now, when we first looked at this video footage, I said to myself, well, this video footage could very well be manipulated. So I wanted to check it out myself. Well, we went and found the DVD that we had purchased shortly after September 11th entitled America Remembers. This was directly from CNN. We took this DVD and put it in our machine and examined the very clip that you've just seen. Let's take a look at it. Let's take another look at this clip in slow motion, but before we do, keep in mind that sometimes the best place to hide something is in plain sight. We've all seen this video clip, and there have been many publications that have taken frames from this video and published them in hundreds of magazines. Here's an example. On page three, a full-size blow-up of this picture. And in this magazine, it was published on page four. And on the back of this book that we discussed earlier, it's on the back cover. I suggest you all take a copy of your magazines and books, and if you have the video footage, take a good hard look. We've all got this. Now let's take a look at this in slow motion. As the plane approaches the South Tower, notice carefully the belly of the plane there appears to be something attached, and just as it hits the building, there's a flash. Let's take another look in super slow motion. Let's look at this photograph that was taken near ground zero. On the right, we see the south tower, and the smoke that's rising into the sky is emanating from the North Tower, which is completely hidden from view. On the left, just entering the field of vision of the camera, we see the plane just before it hits the South Tower. Note a couple of items here. The engine on the right wing has a shadow, and the shadow moves towards the front of the plane and off of the plane. So the anomaly that appears to be attached to the belly of this plane could not be caused by a shadow. Also note that the item that appears to be attached to the belly of this plane is on the right side. This plane has something that is not symmetrical on the bottom of the plane. When we compare that with the bottom of a regular 767, we'll note that a normal 767 has a belly that is smooth. This plane does not. In the summer of 2003, in Barcelona, Spain, a publication by the name of La Vanguardia did an investigative report on the plane that slammed into the South Tower. After a thorough digital image analysis performed by a Spanish university, the investigators came to the conclusion that the anomaly was three-dimensional in nature and could not have been caused by shadows 
or reflections. Question. Is it outside the realm of possibilities that an object of this size and shape could be attached to the belly of a plane of this type? Now let's take another good hard look at this video footage. As the plane approaches, it is irrefutable that there is something attached to the bottom of this plane and a distinct flash as it makes contact. Now there are some that would say that this is a trick of light, a reflection. Well let's keep in mind that if you hold a mirror in your hand and reflect the sun's rays, that reflection only goes where you aim that reflection. So a reflection should only be seen from one particular angle. Let's take a look at this event from another angle. And now let's take a look at it again from a third angle. And now let's take a look at it one more time from a fourth angle. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just seen a very interesting event indeed. Not recorded by one, but recorded by four different cameras from four different angles. There can be no doubt that this is not the result of a reflection of any sort, but in fact was a flash caused by an explosion, a detonation, a missile, something happened that was not a terrorist with a box cutter. Let's take another look at the object attached to the belly of this plane and ask yourself this question. Could something this big have gone unnoticed by the passengers, the crew, the baggage handlers, the service personnel at a commercial airport? The obvious answer is no, it would have been noticed. Which raises the question, where did this plane take off from? And was it in fact a commercial airliner at all? Dove to the other side and crashed right in and the explosion was so terrific it looked like it had dynamite in it. The ball of fire that came flying out of that one was even worse than the first one. And we were standing there and I said, I can't believe this. And sure enough, there it was, another plane. The plane wasn't no uh, airline or anything. It was a twin engine, big gray plane. Mark Burnback, a Fox employee, is on the phone with us. Uh, Mark uh, witnessed this from what we understand. Mark, were you close enough to be able to see any markings on, on the airplane? Uh, hi, gentlemen. How are you doing? Yeah, there was, um, there was definitely a blue logo. It was like a circular logo on the front of the plane, uh, towards the, uh, yeah, definitely towards the front. Um, it definitely did not look like a commercial plane. I didn't see any windows on the sides. And uh, definitely very low. And um, I'm completely panicked. I'm <laughs> you're freaking out. I can't well, believe what I just saw. We are all shaken by this. We are uh, watching the video now back live. Uh, but the upper floors of the World Trade Center in Manhattan in flames now after apparently two large airplanes. We're talking about jet jetliners here slammed into the sides right around nine o'clock this morning. Mark, if what you say is true, those could be cargo planes or something like that. You said you didn't see any windows in the side? I didn't see any windows in the sides. I saw the plane flying low. I was probably like a block away from the subway in Brooklyn, and that plane came down very low. And again, it was, it, it was not a normal flight that I've ever seen at an airport. It was a plane that had a blue uh, logo on the front, and it just it did not look like it belonged in this area. 
We've just heard Mark Birnbeck describe what he saw on September 11th of 2001 when he worked for the Fox News Network. Well, we spoke with Mr. Birnbeck in September of 2004, and he stands by his story. Now let's take another look at the clip where the woman screams, that was not an American Airlines. There are those that would try to say that we've dubbed in the voice or somehow altered the sound portion of this video clip. This time, watch carefully the woman on the right half of the screen. Now, we've just heard testimony that refutes the official report that a commercial airliner hit the World Trade Center. Well, if it wasn't a commercial airliner, it would have to be either a private or a military aircraft, and I think we can rule out private aircraft. I didn't see any windows on the sides. I saw the plane flying low. I was probably... The plane wasn't no uh, airliner or anything. It was a twin-engine, big, gray plane. Now, if this was a military plane, that would explain the possibility that there was something mounted on the belly of the plane. Now, Phil Jahan, webmaster of the website letsroll911.org, and many other people have postulated that this indeed was a pod of some sort mounted to the belly of the plane. Many of our listeners are ex-military and have agreed that this is a distinct possibility. When you couple this with the mysterious flash that occurs on the side of the World Trade Center just as the plane makes contact, I think we can probably agree that there was some sort of an incendiary or an explosive that would serve as a match to ignite the enormous amount of fuel that would be dispersed as soon as the plane hit the building. Let's take another look at this one clip and you'll notice that the flash is a separate event than the contact of the fuselage as it hits the building. Some folks have stated that the flash was a result of the fuselage making contact with the Trade Center building. But as you can see, the flash is indeed to the right of the fuselage and in fact as the fuselage makes contact with the World Trade Tower, you can see a reflection of the flash in the fuselage, which further supports the contention that these are two separate events. Admittedly, what we've seen so far in this presentation is disturbing to say the least. To find that we were not necessarily told the truth about what happened at the Pentagon on September 11th, and now, according to the clips that you've just seen and the testimony that you've just heard, there was a whole lot more to the story when Flight 175 hit the South Tower. Well, I needed more information. I needed more evidence that showed that there was something else going on on September 11th. And the only way to get more information was to go to the first plane, Flight 11, the American airliner that hit the North Tower. The French filmmakers, the Naudet brothers, were in New York City doing a documentary about the New York City firefighters. And this clip is the only known footage of the first plane hitting the first tower. Oh, Let's take another look at this video clip, this time in slow motion. You'll notice that as the plane approaches the tower, first of all, we're too far away to get a clear shot in any detail of the plane. So therefore, it's hard to make out whether or not there was anything attached to the bottom of this plane, as was the case with Flight 175. However, there is another similarity. Just as the plane makes impact, there is a flash. Let's look at it again, and keep in mind that as we watch this plane make impact, this flash occurs just before the plane crashes into the North Tower. This time, as we watch this clip, note the shadow rising from the lower right of the Trade Center Tower, and keep in mind that the shadow won't reach the impact point before the plane and vice versa. This is very important because the flash occurs before the shadow and the plane meet. This time, let's look at this clip in reverse you'll notice that as the plane slowly backs out of the North Tower, it is clear of the tower and then the flash occurs, indicating that the flash occurred before the plane made impact on the North Tower. 
one more time this video clip showing the flash as the plane hit the North Tower. Now this video clip that we've just examined came again from the Naudet Brothers documentary that was being filmed in the streets of New York City on the morning of September 11th. This documentary about the New York City firefighters was going to be assembled at a later date and it was not televised. In fact, there was no live coverage at all of Flight 11 as it hit the North Tower. After all, it was a surprise attack. So if there was no live television coverage of the first plane hitting the first tower, how do we explain the following comment from George Walker Bush? What was the first thing that went through your head when you heard that a plane crashed into the first? Well, I was sitting in a, a schoolhouse in Florida. I'd gone down to tell my little brother what to do. And uh, <laughs> you can go ahead and sit down. Just kidding, Jeb. And uh, it's the mother in me. Anyway. Uh, I uh, was sitting there and my chief of staff, well, first of all, when we walked in the classroom, uh, I had seen this uh, plane fly into the first building. There was a TV set on and, and uh, you know, I thought it was pilot error. You know, right off the bat, there will probably be some folks out there that will try to minimize or negate what we've discussed in this program and turn it into some sort of a political football. They'll say we're, we're left-wingers or we're, we're Democrat liberal types and we're Bush bashing. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Let's not forget that it was under the Clinton administration that we launched a missile attack in Afghanistan and Sudan to destroy what turned out to be an aspirin factory because they had bad intel that they were manufacturing chemicals. It's happening again, folks. It has nothing to do with liberal versus conservative or Democrat versus Republican or right versus left. It has everything to do with right versus wrong. On September 11th, it was reported that the passengers of Flight 93 were in the process of overcoming terrorists who had taken over the plane using box cutters. And in the process, the plane crashed in a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Well, if Flight 93 crashed in Shanksville at 10 o'clock Eastern Time, how do we explain the following story that was carried by WCPO-TV Channel 9 in Cincinnati, Ohio? This story was posted on the Internet at 11.43 a.m. Eastern Time by web producer Liz Foreman. The headline reads, Plane lands in Cleveland. Bomb feared aboard. A Boeing 767 out of Boston made an emergency landing Tuesday at Cleveland Hopkins International Airport due to concerns that it may have a bomb aboard, said Mayor Michael R. White. United identified the plane as Flight 93. If United Airlines Flight 93 crashed at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, then how could Flight 93 also have landed at Cleveland Hopkins International Airport, been evacuated, and searched for a bomb, as was reported at 11.43 Eastern Time by Liz Foreman from WCPO-TV in Cincinnati? Which flight was the real Flight 93? Which flight crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And now we come to the $10,000 question. How is it possible that in the sleepy town of Versailles, Missouri, in a little production studio, we can do an in-depth analysis and a slow motion expose of video footage that's been at the fingertips of every major news network all this time? How is it possible that they can show you slow motion video of car crashes and basketball games and they can do frame by frame analysis of major events in history like the JFK assassination and yet they haven't seen fit to show you one slow motion picture of these planes hitting the towers. Why is it that shortly after September 11th it was decided that it would be too painful for America to see these videos anymore and so they decided to stop showing them? Maybe now we know why they stopped showing these videos. And maybe we should have nothing but contempt for the mainstream networks for withholding this information. After all, if you become aware of a lie and you do nothing to expose the lie, you then become part of the lie. 
Has this ever happened before in American history? Have the mainstream media networks ever suppressed information in regard to terrorist attacks in this country? appears to be the Oklahoma County bomb squad. Uh, it's their bomb disposal unit essentially is what it is and it is what they would use to, if, if the report that we gave you just a few moments ago turns out to be correct, that they have found a second explosive device of some kind inside this building. They'll back that trailer down there and the uh, bomb squad folks will go in and they will use that, uh, that trailer. You see the, the bucket on the back there, sort of, this is how they would transport the explosive device away from this populated area to try to do something now with confirmed. it. Uh, through federal authorities that a second bomb has been found inside that federal building in Oklahoma City. It was an explosion at 9 o'clock this morning that did that damage you're looking at right there, blowing off the entire north face of that building. Again, you're looking at the north face there. A second bomb was found on the east side of that building. A bomb squad is on the scene. That second bomb has not exploded. We don't know quite the status yet if they've managed to defuse it, but it has been confirmed that a second bomb was found on the east side of well, that building. I just building. took a look down the street uh, at the Morrow building again. I see another bomb truck going, so apparently they're going to try to get out that third bomb that's been talked about. Still a lot of activity around the Morrow building. Uh, security concerns that another one still might go off. That's what everybody's worried about. At the present time, the medical teams downtown are unable to get into the wreckage to retrieve more of the injured because of the presence of other uh, bombs in the area. I've been told by the police department that just as soon as those bombs are defused, they will permit the medical teams to enter. Just for a second, we want to update our audience that uh, the Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found in the AP Murrah uh, building in downtown Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, you're still with us, aren't you? Yes, I am. And I, and I might tell you, in addition to that, that in fact, what we were told at the scene a few minutes ago was that, in fact, two different explosive devices were found in addition to the one that went off. So a total of three, A total saying. of three, and, of course, then there was mass confusion whenever uh, there were hundreds of spectators in the area, and when they heard that there were other bombs in the building, people were running from the area in the opposite direction as fast as they could. Utter devastation that that one explosion caused, because here's now what we are starting to learn about uh, the succession or what someone obviously hoped would be a succession of explosions. The first bomb that was in the federal building did go off. It did the damage that you see right there. The second explosive was found and diffused. The third explosive that was found, and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. So try to imagine two Boy. or threefold happening mm -hmm. Uh, what we've already seen there. It is just uh, incredible to think that there was that much heavy artillery that was somehow moved into the downtown Oklahoma President City. President Clinton Federal. just called Frank uh, Keating, Governor Frank Keating, and he says that three FBI anti-terrorist teams are en route to Oklahoma City. Right now, they are saying that this is the work of a sophisticated group. This is a very uh, sophisticated uh, device, and um, it has to have been done by an explosives expert, um, obviously. You talk about uh, the second bomb that was found. Uh, Devin told us earlier we got information that the second and third bomb were bigger than the one that was detonated. 1,200 pounds of explosives in that first one that went off. The second and third devices that were found were actually larger than that. So you can undetonated imagine. bombs that were found that were bigger than the device that exploded. And if this other one that they're looking at now turns out to be something, it appears that it was meant for this building to come down, to be leveled because of the uh, amount of power that could have gone off only one explosion, it was obviously tragic enough, but there were four bombs set to go off, according to ATF officials. The question is, why that building? And was it Waco? Uh, is it uh, Nation of Islam? We should find out an awful lot uh, when the bombs are taken apart. I think it was a, a great stroke of luck. As you're mentioning, it's hard to talk about luck on a day like today in Oklahoma City, but it was a great stroke of luck that we actually have got diffused bombs. It's through the bomb material that we will be able to track down uh, who committed this atrocity. I'm sure many of you were shocked after seeing these clips that you've just seen that were taken from local affiliate stations in Oklahoma City right after the bombing. Many of us never heard about the discovery of a second bomb and a third bomb and the retrieval of a bomb and the statement that we actually have got defused bombs. This information was suppressed. It was kept from the American people. Why? 
How many pieces of evidence do we need to prove that there is a conspiracy? In regard to September 11th, we discussed Flight 77. Did it hit the Pentagon? How could it have hit the Pentagon and left a 16-foot hole and no wreckage? And then when it came to Building 7, we have Larry Silverstein making the statement that they decided to pull it, indicating that there could have been demolition charges. And we couple that with the firefighters who were interviewed and stated that it was like demolition charges going off. And then there was the anomaly that was attached to the bottom of Flight 175, or so we thought Flight 175 hitting the South Tower. The mysterious flash as it made contact, caught not by one, or by two, or by three, but by four different cameras. And then there's the analysis of the North Tower and the mysterious flash of that flight slamming into the building. How many pieces of evidence do we need before America and the world recognizes that there is a conspiracy? And now we come to the most important question of all, and that is, who do we trust? The questions raised in this video documentary are admittedly terrifying, but the answers may be even more terrifying. We offer an open hand and not a clenched fist to every man and woman that serves in uniform, whether it be law enforcement or military. You've all taken an oath to protect and serve or to support and defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. And you are going to be charged with the responsibility of protecting the American people, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution. Our way of life is in jeopardy, and you will be charged with the responsibility of defending our way of life and the people of this country. The biggest challenge before you right now is, who is the enemy? There are those that would ask the question, why would our government be involved in such a horrendous act of terrorism? Or what would the motive possibly be? Well, let's remember a couple of things. First of all, it's been said that those that forget their history are destined to repeat it. And it's also been said that history was written by those that hanged the heroes. We're now just finding out, and it's becoming common knowledge, that the attack on Pearl Harbor wasn't the surprise attack we were all told it was. In fact, the powers that be knew days ahead of time that the attack was pending. And then there's the Northwoods documents that were released in 1961, in which the Joint Chiefs spelled out plans to attack their own ships, sink battleships, let off bombs, and have terrorist attacks here in the United States to instill patriotism and raise anger against the communists so that we could find an entry into the Cold War. We all know that war makes money. And the events at Pearl Harbor and the very existence of the Northwoods documents should represent a mindset and a clear intent of the powers that be to involve themselves in clandestine operations and to sacrifice the lives of our men and women in uniform and civilians as well, as long as it will legitimize their involvement in some sort of a military conflict. Let's look at the world situation today. The United States is the only remaining world superpower. Russia is our best friend now, or so we're told, and China is our biggest trading partner. Simply ask Walmart or Dollar General or any other major retailer where most of the goods are manufactured in China. Well, if there is no world superpower boogeyman or enemy to be watching over, well then what better enemy to have than a nameless, faceless enemy without a country that can strike at will in any corner of the globe, the war on terror. A war that, as Dick Cheney has said, could last for decades. Yes, war means money. And defense contracting is the largest industry in the country, if not the world. Billions, if not trillions of dollars, are awarded to defense contractors every year. And they'll manufacture $75 hammers or $600 toilet seats grossly overcharging the American taxpayer. Where does all this extra money go? And now we have to ask the question, how do defense contractors guarantee job security and profitability? And the common sense answer is to guarantee that there is war. Well, you might ask, why doesn't the mainstream media tell us about this? Why hasn't Tom Brokaw or NBC News told us? Well, as an example, NBC is owned by General Electric. General Electric is one of the top 10 defense contractors. Keeping this information in mind, 
it should be easy to understand how and why the United States would create an Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden was a CIA asset. He was trained by and funded by the CIA. He was put into power by the CIA. And he had substantial financial ties to the current administration. Saddam Hussein was also supported by the United States government. He was given agricultural credits, which he then used to purchase illegal chemical and biological weapons, according to Senator Donald Regal's report. Question, is it not outside the realm of possibilities that the United States would create a boogeyman, create an Osama bin Laden or a Taliban or an Al-Qaeda, on which they could place the blame of the events of September 11th and other yet-to-occur terrorist acts? In the beginning of this program, we played word association, if you recall. The term was conspiracy theory. Now, you've seen enough evidence in this presentation to know that we are dealing now with a conspiracy. There is plenty of evidence to support it. The conspiracy theory, in fact, is the idea that Osama bin Laden had something to do with the attacks of September 11th. Let's not forget that on September 23rd of 2001, Condoleezza Rice, National Security Advisor, had stated that they had evidence that linked bin Laden with the terrorist attacks and that they would release that evidence in due time. Well, America and the world are still waiting for that evidence. And in that time since September 11th, we've launched not one, but two wars in Afghanistan and Iraq based upon no evidence or a conspiracy theory. Our war is against evil, not against Islam. We don't hold any religion accountable. We're fighting evil. What we've seen on this video should give us all cause to stop and rethink everything that we've been told about September 11th. The media and our government have relentlessly pounded into Americans' minds that it was terrorists wielding box cutters that were responsible for the attacks in America on September 11th. And now after seeing this video footage, we realize that it couldn't possibly have been a terrorist and a box cutter that would have created the flashes on both the North and South Tower. Nor could it have been a terrorist with a box cutter that had that attachment to the bottom of Flight 175. There is one truth that's come out of this, though, and that is that there is a war on freedom. But the war on freedom isn't being waged by those that they say it is. After all, how many of your freedoms have been legislated away by Osama bin Laden or the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or Saddam Hussein? The answer is none. Your freedoms have been legislated away by the very people who take oaths to defend your freedoms. Republicans and Democrats alike. Your Congress, your Senate, your President. There is a war on freedom. And now, thanks to the Homeland Security Bill that Patriot Act, the Terrorist Bill, the Model States Emergency Health Powers Act. We have thumb scanners and retina scans and face recognition, metal detectors. At the airports, we have body scans and body cavity searches. Yes, there is a war on freedom. And let's not forget what George Bush had said in regard to conspiracy theories. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. Malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves, away from the guilty. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. A much calmer situation and a much better evacuation. And, and, these, and these people... And now I ask all of America and the people of the world, where's your line in the sand? <laughs>